recording so that we can post it on our web. And so I wanted to give a little introduction uh, to why we're talking about strain echo. Seems like uh, that's been pretty well talked about. Dr. Bonches, uh, who, good morning, uh, good morning, Justin. Dr. Bonches, who made a presentation on strain echo a couple years ago for this conference, did an excellent job. And uh, I, w I became interested in strain echo about four years ago because of advanced cardiac imaging, which is our program here. And uh, basically, uh, I sent uh, our echo tech to Dr. Bonches' lab there at MD Anderson. And we had a couple machines shipped in at the same time, one from Biosound and another from Philips. And we were going to test those against the GE unit, which we did. And when we trained our tech for a couple days, and she learned how to do the acquisition, then she learned how to do the post-processing, and then she spent time with Dr. Bonches, and then she came back, and then we brought in a, a highfalutin a GE unit, and we were ready to go. Well, that was four years ago, and... Uh, we were also involved a little bit in the SUCCAR study from the beginning, but after a while, uh, our patients really wanted to get the strain echo, and they didn't want to be controls so, and have it not used. So because it's a private clinic, we had to uh, bow out of the study because everyone wanted strain, and our patients are very knowledgeable that come into this practice. And so um, we, have started, we started doing strain four years ago, and we did it on every patient that's come to the clinic. And it's really, if you do that way, it's no time added. It becomes like a minute or two added to the study, uh, added to our acquisition. And so, and then I get to, I get a chance to look at it. Well, we looked at that for a long time, and you know, you sort of blow past them and say, "There's a strain. There's a strain. That's what is that doing?" And after a while, when we find something to validate it with, we became very excited. And we were validating it with CT MPI, which is uh, CT uh, myocardial perfusion imaging, where we're imaging the iodine in the myocardium and uh, doing something to vasodilate to cause hyperemia. And so we do a lot of CTs here. And so integrating with CT MPI was an eye opener because for the first time we got to correlate uh, what the CT MPI was showing, the distribution of iodine subtended by a lesion, whether it's intermediate lesion or severe lesion or mild lesion. And if there was a hunk of calcium we couldn't see inside, we could uh, basically validate that with the myocardial perfusion and then validate that uh, with the uh, strain echo. And so then we started really seeing a lot of stuff with strain echo uh, because it wasn't just hanging out there, it was validated with something. And, uh, and we saw a great correlation. And so since then, strain echo has become invaluable to our practice on an everyday basis, not just uh, the people that we see uh, who are cardio-oncology patients. And so with that in mind, we thought we would revisit strain echo and uh, take this opportunity to talk about it again uh, with actually some practical notes, starting with the theoretical and then showing some of our studies and talking about the correlation. So let's go with that. So we have uh, our cardiac fellow, Nick Koch, who's on our rotation uh, here for a month. And Nick's going to tell you about the theoretical basis of strain, uh, which may be a reiteration for you. And then after that, he's going to, we're going to show some of our studies, which is probably going to be more interesting. And we're, going to, we're actually going to not show a lot of cardio-oncology because uh, we've got some great correlation with uh, coronary artery disease, hypertension, and everyone's seen a lot of cardio-oncology. And so we're going to show you uh, the everyday basis of it, and then we apply it to cardio-oncology. So I'm going to give you Nick. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. So I'm Nick Koch. I'm a third-year general cardiology fellow here down in St. Pete, Florida, uh, doing kind of advanced imaging month and really kind of interested in uh, echo and just all these imaging modalities. And strain has kind of been one of the most recent uh, um, kind of modalities as part of echo evaluation that, that we can use. There's a lot of good data on it. So some of this we can probably certainly review that we can kind of go through lightly. But, you know, what's the problem here? So we want to, you know, evaluate LV function. Typically we do this by, you know, a lot of times subjective eyeball technique. We look at endocardial thickening as well as some 
kind of semi-quantification methods. Uh, we can measure symptoms, we can look for wall motion in certain segments, uh, and we have more objective measurements. But the whole issue here uh, with a lot of these disease states, whether it be cardio-oncology, you know, mitral regurgitation, coronary disease, is a lot of times there's subclinical systolic dysfunction before the actual EF drops. And we're seeing some more studies now. Uh, I mentioned one with hypertension, but also recently came out with mitral regurgitation where um, the subclinical fall into systolic dysfunction actually is predictive of worse outcomes even before the EF drops. So a little bit of review, you know, the, the whole basis of this, uh, one of the ways we can do strain is with tissue Doppler imaging. This is based on, as we all know, the Doppler principle where we're sending out signals uh, and we're measuring the frequency shift of the reflected ultrasound beam. Um, you know, one of the big caveats to Doppler imaging is this angle, um, isolation angle here, where, you know, ideally if we're lined up uh, um, in parallel with the blood flow signal, we don't lose any. But as soon as we start getting off axis here, we start to lose uh, uh, errors of measurement that may underestimate the true flow there. Uh, Doppler echo, we got, you know, again, we have pulse wave, continuous wave Doppler. Um, these are kind of the modalities that, you know, one of the ways we can measure um, strain that we'll talk about is uh, tissue Doppler imaging. And a lot of these are based on kind of a pulse wave Doppler uh, technology. So tissue Doppler approach, you know, when we're measuring red blood cells and traditional Doppler flow imaging, you know, blood cells have high velocity, low amplitude, so we're imaging uh, these velocities up here. Um, what we learned is that we can kind of now put a filter on, we can look for these lower velocities, higher amplitude signals, um, filter out the blood, and now we have velocity of the myocardial tissue itself, and we can look at the velocity of that. And we have looked at, you know, one of the measures of systolic function is just looking at the velocity of the myocardial tissue itself, and, you know, theoretically reduced velocity, um, Go along, goes along with systolic dysfunction, but there are some caveats to that as well. So again, blood flow velocity, much higher velocities as opposed to the myocardial tissue velocities that are much lower, uh, but larger in amplitudes. So, you know, we use a modified pulse wave Doppler technology to record these velocities. We reject the higher blood flow velocities, but there are some uh, issues with this that we'll look at. So tissue-derived strain imaging that we'll talk about, you know, has been used in a lot of clinical utilities we'll mention. And, you know, certainly diagnostic, prognostic, and response to treatment. Um, again, you know, myocardial tissue itself, the LV is a very complex uh, tissue structure with a lot of different movements. You know, it shortens during systole not only longitudinally, but also thickens radially and kind of uh, twists and shortens uh, circumferentially. So, again, you know, when we're doing tissue Doppler imaging uh, for evaluation of strain or even diastolic function uh, for other systolic velocity measures, Again, this angle here, if we just keep this uh, sector width as normal, you know, we're introducing errors and measurements as opposed to if we narrow the sector window, reduce the angle here. And again, we kind of want to avoid uh, more than 15 degrees uh, to avoid underestimating the velocity. And so looking at pure tissue velocity, this is, uh, you know, everyone's familiar with this curve. Uh, certainly, you know, we use this for evaluation diastolic dysfunction. We get velocities along a, uh, um, a portion of the signal that we choose. The big caveats with tissue Doppler imaging are, you know, a couple. One is translational motion and Doppler angle. Uh, so certainly a lot of these tissue, these uh, pathologies we're worried about, you know, infarction, coronary disease, you know, we want to look for dysfunctional segments. You know, even if we have an akinetic segment here, the normal myocardium can pull and tether this normal segment, which, of course, you know, if we're just looking at velocities, this segment's going to show that it has normal velocity or possibly normal velocity, and so it may mask a akinetic segment. And again, the whole uh, Doppler angle issue comes up as well. Even just respiration imparts movement to the ventricular wall itself, even if there's no th local thickening uh, that can cause some tissue velocity. So that leads us to strain imaging. What is strain? You know, it's very basic. You know, strain is a deformation of the myocardial uh, tissue itself. So it's a change in length uh, over a period of time uh, on a uh, uh, deformed portion of the myocardial itself. So, you know, at its basic strain is, you know, train, change in length over the original length here. It's a dimensionless quantity, usually presented as a uh, fraction of the percentage change. As we know, the heart, you know, three axes, so we can kind of relate these to the left ventricle as longitudinal strain, circumferential, and transmural or radial uh, strain. So by definition with strain, again, uh, because of the formula, uh, while, you know, shortening is a negative strain, so circumferential and longitudinal uh, directions, the uh, heart uh, shortens, we get a negative strain number, 
in radial, it thickens when we get a positive strain. We will mention this kind of can impart some confusion, uh, uh, certainly when we report values and kind of, you know, talk amongst uh, our general uh, colleagues as opposed to the negative and positive strain. Um, so for the LV, we end up getting three values, longitudinal, circumferential, and radial. Uh, most of the studies have really validated longitudinal strain, um, less so for circumferential and radial strain. But as we see, this global longitudinal strain value uh, certainly averaged over multiple views is typically what we see reported. So again, longitudinal strain, we get a negative number, circumferential, we get a negative number, and then radial strain thickening, we get a positive number. So strain and strain, weight, strain, and strain rate are related. Um, you know, certainly a lot of times strain rate is what we're actually measuring, the velocity of the uh, tissue thickening on a local area, and we get a curve. And we take the integration of all these strain rates over time, and we come up with a strain value of a change in length over of a predefined segment of the heart over time. Strain rate as well, you know, very similar to the strain equation, um, uh, but now we're using velocities is usually what we measure. So, we, you know, if we highlight a segment of the myocardium, we pick two segments, we know the distance, we have two velocities, we can measure these velocities over time, then we can integrate that and get a, come up with a strain or just actual change of the length uh, for each time. Kind of skip a couple of these and just kind of, you know, theoretical basis, a lot of times we're measuring the actual strain rate. You know, if we integrate this over time, which the, you know, the machines do, we come up with a strain value. Um, but all, you know, even just displacement, uh, velocity, like tissue doppler velocity, strain, and strain rate, they're all related, um, either being, you know, derived or integrated over time. So again, kind of the four tissue, you know, this is based on tissue doppler. You know, we come up with just plain velocity of the tissue, actual displacement. Uh, strain rate and strain. And as we talked about, you know, certainly just looking at velocity or displacement have a lot of errors that are introduced uh, by you know, myocardial motion and other artifacts. So we can look at, there are normal tables. We'll mention, you know, some issues with uh, between vendors and software packages. Uh, this is from a 2004 uh, American Society of Echo, uh, where each, you know, Theoretically, each segment of the heart has its own kind of normal strain value. These have been less well validated, uh, more so looking at global strain patterns, but you can look at kind of individual wall segments um, you know, here with the peak strain. Skip through some of these. Then we kind of come to normal strain values. So this is from the latest 2015 uh, American Society of Echo uh, guidelines. Um, you know, the big thing for strain echo and now with speckle tracking is, you know, each company and software package does it slightly different. Some measure more endocardial speckle tracking, some do mid, uh, uh, mid wall uh, speckle tracking. And so there are some slight differences in how they uh, measure, uh, how they do the speckle tracking. Um, I just found earlier today, just another article, uh, 2015, they looked at kind of a head to head comparison between all these software packages and they found pretty good, you know, there were some significant differences, a few percentage points among the different software packages. But overall, the differences were really better than any other, any other measure we use now, including uh, ejection fraction and, and uh, kind of uh, um, LV dimensions, uh, but using the same echo tech on different software packages. You, could you explain the difference between strain and, or the uh, subtle difference between strain and speckle tracking? Yeah, so kind of, the, uh, yep. So when we talk about strain and speckle tracking, we're trying to talk about two different things. So both these method, methods are, uh, strain is a kind of a fun, myocardial, it's a measure of myocardial function. So strain and strain rate itself is a, just a measure of systolic function of the myocardial tissue itself. So all strain is, is a change in deformation of the myocardial uh, heart over systole and diastole. And there's different ways to measure strain using echo. Um, there's really two. Yeah, when you say when you say strain versus strain rate, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in particular, strain rate is a description of acceleration, correct? Correct. Yeah. Uh, so strain rate is purely the change in velocity. Um, you know, if we pick up, if we measure like the lateral wall, and we have two segments, a centimeter apart on the lateral wall, we can put tissue Doppler on it. We can measure the rate of velocity of those two measure of those two points, how fast they thickened you know, how fast they go towards each other, away from each other. And so we can measure velocity at two points in a myocardial segment and measure the velocities as they come towards each other and away from each other, divided by the original velocity. So that's strain rate itself. That's just the change in 
velocity of a two segments of the heart wall as they're traveling, you know, either as they're thickening or uh, uh, shortening. Um, strain is very similar to that. It's just the integration of all those changes in velocity over time to come up with a percentage change in length. So when we're talking about strain, we're talking about change in length, um, size of the tissue. And when we're talking about strain rate, we're talking about change in velocity of the, uh, of the tissue itself. And both can be used uh, you know, to evaluate uh, dysfunction of that segment of the heart wall. Um, more so now, you know, more validation with strain uh, than there is the strain rate. There's less kind of, uh, uh, from what I've seen, um, correlation with, uh, or I guess standardization of strain rates, more so with actual strain values. And so both. So, so when you when you report like a minus 20 for a for a global longitudinal strain, that is different than a strain rate. Yes. Yeah. Actually, let me go back to. No, absolutely correct. So, a so here's this graph here. So, here an example we're looking at kind of the you know the the apical uh, septal segment of uh, left ventricle here, and so all these are measuring the same part of the heart wall, heart wall tissue here. Here's a strain rate and strain. We'll focus on these two. So strain rate is a um, here we have systole aortic valve opening aortic valve closure, and we're measuring the velocity of the um, tissue itself here. So, you know, here we have a negative strain rate. So that's telling me that at this section of the heart wall during systole, these two areas are coming towards each other or shortening. Um, and then during kind of diastole, the strain rate becomes positive because now these two, now the myocardial tissue is relaxing and the two points are going away from each other. And so we get this kind of bimodal appearance here during diastole. So that's strain rate. This is a velocity. Uh, you can see the uh, um, it's you know, seconds to the negative one. Um, usually these are numbers in the kind of the single digits. If we, and the software does this automatically, if we integrate all these over time, we come up with a strain. And the strain is a percentage dimensionless quantity. So when we report like a negative 20%, negative 5%, uh, negative 15%, we're reporting the strain. And all that is is an integration of all these values here. So you can see here, you know, even during diastole, this is still a negative number. Uh, this is because the velocities are now decreasing over time. Um, so kind of an important difference, um, but they're, you know, but they are very related. Uh, but yeah, usually when we report uh, a value of negative 15, negative 20 percent, if it's a percent, we're reporting just the, the, the strain value itself. Uh, that's an excellent explanation. Thank you. And then the, when you talk about speckled tracking, though, you're talking about a different technique. Correct, yeah. So up until this point, all those methods I mentioned have been using the tissue Doppler technique. And there's really, and so when we talk about strain imaging, we can use two different technologies to measure strain. Uh, we can usually, you know, up to, you know, before we had speckled tracking, we had tissue Doppler. So it was the older method. Uh, it was really angle dependent. So all the caveats I mentioned earlier with tissue Doppler applied when we looked at strain with tissue Doppler, you know, the angle of interrogation. Um, you know, some tethering artifact. So we have this newer modality called speckled tracking, which will give us kind of a similar strain, you know, so again, we're measuring strain, we're just using a different under, underlying technology to measure it, and we'll talk about speckled tracking. Um, again, for strain, just some uh, practical uh, things of how do we get these images. Again, uh, we, can, we usually use this three standard apical views, the four chamber, the two chamber, the long axis. Um, and so if we're using 2D echo, we can measure, you know, first we get a four chamber view, we get a two chamber view and a long axis view, and we measure strain in each of those views. One of the problems here is we're using different beats of the cardiac cycle. Uh, we'll talk about one of the newer ways is doing using 4D imaging. Uh, so currently what we do here, so real time 3D, is we use a 4D probe and we can have all these windows at one time. And so we're measuring strain over the same exact heartbeat. Because strain is somewhat load dependent, um, you know, certainly if you have irregular rhythms such as atrial fibrillation where the R-to-R interval is different, you may have different loading conditions. And so if you have a longer R-to-R interval in one image and then you switch to the two chamber and there's a lot of ectopy, you know, technically that could change the strain a little bit. So 4D imaging, one of the advantages is, you know, like Dr. Harrison said, it really even makes it quicker where we have our three views all at once that we'll see examples of and we get strain imaging just with one, you know, with one cardiac cycle. So speckled tracking, uh, like you mentioned, is kind of a newer technology or technique to measure strain. 
So really it's a, uh, you know, when we do ultrasound uh, images, we get reflections, scattering, interference of the ultrasound beam, and this produces kind of char characteristics, kind of a fingerprint of each uh, myocardial segment. And these fingerprints are relatively stable over a short time period. And so what we're making use of, we're making use of this interference pattern that the computer will see this interference pattern, it'll lock onto it, and it'll track it over time. And so, you know, the fact that it has this particular, you know, maybe this uh, bright point here, this point here, it's tracking over time, and it can measure how it moves, how it deforms, how it twists, rotates, and how it shortens and lengthens. And we're using that instead of the, the velocities to measure the deformation of this segment of the myocardial tissue itself. And so really the big advantage is it's largely angle independent um, um, as opposed to tissue Doppler where we have a lot of the other issues. And so this is all special, speckle tracking is we're making use of this kind of property of interference of the ultrasound pattern. Usually these are blocks of about 20 to 40 pixels. Uh, we're just happen to make use of this interference pattern to lock onto that part of the wall and measure how it moves over time. So it, well, so it allows us to do is certainly, you know, if we're looking at kind of uh, the twist or, uh, uh, of the heart as well, you know, tissue Doppler, you know, certainly here it would be very difficult because, you know, we're looking at all sorts of different angles of interrogation as opposed to speckle tracking. It can lock on to an interference pattern of the heart itself and over time and it can look at how it moves and, and twists. So a largely, you know, uh, you know, being angle independent gives us a lot more flexibility in measuring the heart in different uh, um, ways and how it moves. And it has shown us where, um, you know, back to kind of more physiology we don't have to dwell on, but, you know, the heart is, you know, the left ventricle, the apical segment, and the basal segments kind of uh, twist in different directions, sort of like wringing out a towel. So if we look at speckled tracking, you know, the apex uh, may counterclockwise rotation as opposed to the basal segments have a, have a clockwise rotation. So these strain patterns will be uh, uh, opposite each other, uh, showing this kind of uh, twisting pattern of the heart. Some of these we can skip through. And so we can also use these twist dynamics to look at different sort of pathologies um, with the heart as well. And so what do we end up with speckle tracking? So the, here's an example of using 2D images for speckle tracking. Uh, you know, here's the apical long axis view. The, a lot of times the computer does this automated where it'll uh, lock on to the uh, basilar segments and usually divide it into a basilar, mid, and apical wall segment here. Uh, color codes these that correspond to uh, the wall segments here, and it you know it tracks these speckles and you know you can as you know if you were watching this in live uh, video you can see these kind of uh, speckles moving as the heart moves, and each of these co correspond to a color code on the bar graph here, and we get a negative uh, strain pattern, so pretty normal. And we can look at this data in multiple ways. We can superimpose it here. We can lay these out into kind of a flat uh, panel over the cardiac cycle during systole and diastole, and uh, a, certainly the negative 20 here, pretty normal strain pattern. Here's an example of a 4D acquisition. This happens to be one of our examples here, where instead of doing each, you know, using the 2D probe and doing each view separately, this is using the 4D probe at the, uh, at the same time simultaneously. We get an apical four-chamber, two-chamber, long-axis view here um, over a couple cardiac cycles, and we get it with one shot. So, you know, we may do a bunch of these depending on the image quality to get the best uh, myocardial definition. Uh, but certainly very quick and, you know, really adds no time at all uh, to an exam. So when you, when you have, like, you see a, a report about global, global longitudinal strain and then you see, uh, uh, you know, some, some change in the global longitudinal strain and, uh, you know, make some correlation to, to a finding, uh, you see that either in an individual patient story or in some report, you know, it sounds to me like you have to know the vendor and the type of, you know, acquisition, whether it's tissue Doppler or speckle tracking, and in the current technology, is speckle tracking considered the best or overall method? And then to go back to that, so do all the major vendors use that technology? So some of that specific, so if someone else uh, has more data, uh, can certainly speak up. But the, yeah, certainly if you see a report that reports a global longitudinal strain number of negative 20%, you see another report a year later, now it's dropped at, you know, maybe 18% or 17, negative 17%. You know, that's one of the issues with this modality overall is that there are differences between software packages and vendors. Um, there are, you know, studies that have 
looked at kind of normal values that change somewhat on each vendor specific. I think the biggest takeaway or one of the big takeaways here is if you're going to do strain, certainly measuring serial strain over time in the same patient should probably be with the same vendor package with the same echo machine. I think there's probably more utility in, you know, if you're seeing a patient in follow-up scans, making sure that that scan is done at the same place. Um, you know, certainly if you have, you know, it's probably important to bring them into your clinic where you have your machine that you know the typical normals of as opposed to the patient going uh, to multiple different places to get follow-up echoes because um, I think that's the biggest problem. If you do one strain report from your machine but they go elsewhere a year later and get another report and it's slightly different, how much of that is due to inter-vendor uh, differences versus a true drop? I think there's more, it's more telling if there's a change in strain done on the same machine as opposed to if it's done on different ones. Well, and so like, for example, at Vanderbilt, you know, we have like, you know, 13, 12 or 13 machines. And let's just say that, one, let's say one of the machines has this latest, greatest version, and you would have to match that patient to that exact machine uh, on the time that you give, you know, you know, you get the follow-up echo. I mean, uh, you can just you could just imagine the list logistical nightmare there. Oh, definitely, and they even mentioned if there's a software, you know, all these vendors are constantly having software updates. Even just a software update may change how they measure it because uh, one of the studies I saw from 2015, they looked at they compared uh, I think seven different vendors. The only uh, they all did speckle tracking, but the only speckle tracking that all seven had in common was endocardial speckle tracking, and so that's really. That's what they measured here. I think some vendors do mid-wall speckle tracking. I think like ours here, some do endocard or sub -in or endocardial speckle tracking, and so these even differences among that way. So I mean, absolutely correct. The logistics become an issue where making sure it's done with the same you know vendor software package version of the software on the same machine, and that can be difficult. Uh, certainly, if you know someone's coming back in, it's you know usually that sort of stuff is not reported um, unless it's kind of a, a clinic that takes that into consideration and makes that part of the workflow. Um, I mean, I'm not sure how that's being done elsewhere as opposed to, you know, certainly a smaller clinic here uh, that's easy to do as opposed to a large uh, tertiary care center uh, that you may have, you know, that may sh machine may be used and who knows which machine is in, 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 uh, available when that patient comes back in, but you're absolutely correct. So just a comparison, you know, the two modalities to measure strain uh, you know, both have been validated in different animal studies uh, for speckle tracking and uh, Doppler imaging. Usually they've been uh, validated with MRI uh, techniques. But again, the big uh, advantage of speckle tracking, independent of angle, and really a lot of inter, uh, inter, inter I'm sorry, interpretive uh, variability with speckle tracking. Uh, as I can be there uh, in 15 minutes. I'm at the office, but I can drive down. Okay, perfect. Thanks. A lot of... Uh, so, you know, the clinical applications will go into some more clinical aspects of uh, uh, strain and some examples that we've had here. Um, so really we just for assessing regional, uh, mostly global systolic and diastolic dysfunction. It's been tagged, uh, correlated pretty well with tagged MRI, MRI strain, which uh, kind of what was used prior to this. Um, and really the whole key is early detection of, you know, subclinical LV dysfunction. So we can use it for looking for ischemic or infarcted segments. So here's an example of a patient with a kind of a uh, trans, this is a late guided lineal enhancement on an MRI of the left ventricle. So we have transmural infarction to kind of the apical segments as well as subendocardial uh, ischemia kind of in the lateral wall here. So if we look at these apical segments uh, characterized by this green and purple segment on strain, these areas have uh, reduced strain or a less negative number as opposed to the more normal segments here. And now if you just focus on this apical segment here, as we go from more normal myocardial tissue up to the more transmural infarcted tissue, we have less and less negative strain. So we can use it somewhat for kind of regionality, uh, looking for segments that have um, reduced strain as opposed to normal segments. Uh, for acute ischemia, uh, there are some strain features uh, during, a, during episodes of ischemia that we can look at. So this yellow segment, this is a pretty normal strain pattern here. But we can get systolic lengthening. We can kind of, we can get reduced strain itself, and we can, we can also get post-systolic shortening. You know, if we look at uh, the green marker, you'll see on all these strain uh, uh, images is the aortic valve closure. Post-systolic shortening is also indicative of ischemia. 
for cardiomyopathy, certainly a normal strain pattern, we can look at these images just in the polar plot that shows us the basal, mid, and apical segments of the heart. You know, uh, amyloid cardiac involvement, even if the heart muscle is not thickened or has a typical appearance on echo, we may see characteristics of um, cardiac involvement that we may not see else, uh, you know, if we're just looking for LVH. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, certainly, you know, fam familial screening, even if you don't have a severely abnormal thickened heart, um, you know, if you have evidence of um, a reduced strain, that may lead you to believe that this patient has uh, involvement of the, uh, you know, one of these cardiomyopathies. Even differentiating pathology, so if we're looking at athlete's heart versus hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you know, sometimes these hearts may appear similarly thickened, uh, uh, but strain may help us differentiate, you know, abnormal strain in the Hocum patient versus normal systolic function, even though they have kind of the typical athletic heart and the uh, LV uh, geometry change uh, associated with that. We can also use it for RV function, so kind of the Mayo format, here's the RV here. Uh, kind of less well validated, but the same principle applies. We're looking at strain patterns in the RV. Uh, some places don't look at the septum. They kind of more focus on the RV wall. But the good thing about the RV is, you know, m the majority of the systolic function is in the longitudinal direction as opposed to the LV. Uh, so usually the longitudinal uh, strain is very similar. And some centers, certainly the ASC documents, uh, you know, negative uh, 20 is kind of the cutoff for abnormal and normal. Uh, detection of coronary disease, uh, certainly like we mentioned, we can skip through some of these. Viability, uh, we can also look for myocardial viability. So, you know, if we compared it to uh, PET scanning for viability, uh, for dibutamine viability test, the addition of strain imaging increases the sensitivity specificity uh, here. So, you know, this may be a non-viable yellow curve here segment, uh, both dibutamine stimulation, now we see um, in this case, we're looking at a strain rate, um, but we're looking at increase in strain uh, with dibutamine. Uh, there's been a lot of look now for different pathologies. Most recently, this was in August of this year, uh, looked at prognostic implications of abnormal strain in asymptomatic patients with hypertension. So, in, you know, a group with asymptomatic hypertension that had abnormal LV geometry, whether it be uh, LVH, or other geometry changes, they looked at global longitudinal strain and circumferential strain followed for uh, major adverse cardiac events. And really they looked, you know, patients who had adverse cardiac events, they had a higher prevalence of um, impaired global longitudinal strain and this abnormal strain was, you know, predictive and incremental to other clinical parameters. So certainly, you know, older patients, LVH, AFib, all correlated with, you know, uh, increased events down the line, but impaired strain was additive uh, and independent of these other clinical uh, uh, parameters. So they found that, you know, adverse events was correlated with all these, uh, you know, typical uh, clinical mm -hmm. symptoms that we know about, but the impairment of the diastolic function and strain was also additive to it. And they came up with a score, you know, that allowed them to come up with a discrimination for, they found mostly for heart failure admissions, but a score of greater than three um, was pretty sensitive for future heart failure admissions. So you can, you know, even an elderly patient with no AFib or LVH, but abnormal strain, they automatically meet this, um, uh, this kind of cutoff. And, you know, theoretically it kind of makes sense if we're looking for subclinical LV dysfunction. So when it says, like right there, it says global longitudinal strain greater than negative 16. So does that mean that the number was 18 or 20? negative 18 or 20, or what does that mean? Yeah, no, this certainly highlights the problem with um, kind of the semantics of this. So, great, and a lot of people even advocate using the absolute value of this. So, abnormal, so, you know, if we say a cutoff for abnormal strain, or normal strain is about negative 20, an abnormal strain is a less negative number or a higher absolute value. So, a neg you know, if we, if we use negative 16 here, a negative 18 or negative 20 is a greater amount of strain or more normal as opposed to negative 14, negative 12, 1, 2, 5. Uh, those are impaired strain or uh, reduced strain. Um, so it so is, in, this, in this table, that's what they mean. Correct. So the number was, the number was 10. Correct, yeah. So negative, have, negative 10 or Yeah, something. negative 10 would be abnormal strain as opposed to negative 18. Uh, that was abnormal strain. And here they use a cutoff of negative 16. Uh, some studies have looked at 18 or 19. Uh, for some of the healthy volunteer normals I've seen for vendor packages, usually they're around the negative 19 to 20 is the normal strain. Um, 
but yeah, certainly a lot of semantics involved, and some places report just absolute value. Some just use you know impair or you know reduced or uh, uh, normal strain. So just some strength and weaknesses. So you know, very reproducible. Uh, certainly, if you have a trained echo tech that's comfortable with it on the same machine, it's very reproducible value uh, from study to study. We can you know recognize early uh, LV dysfunction. Certainly, in a lot of different um, cardiac pathologies, not just uh, cardio oncology. Um, Cardiotoxicity chemotherapy. Obviously, you know, traditionally we looked at drop in EF. Um, this is kind of uh, a study from 2015 that, uh, you know, kind of the flow chart for, you know, we, you know, we all recognize a drop in EF as related to cardiac dysfunction, but they kind of uh, put out there a relative drop in global longitudinal strain as a, compared to the baseline, and this was kind of a percentage of drop, not an absolute value drop. So, uh, you, you know, certainly you have a patient, you're following serial measurements, ideally on the same machine with the same software package, if you get a drop in the strain, of you know 15 percent you know so say that the value goes from negative 20 uh, to negative 10 um, if you know that is a 15 percent drop or re reduction in the strain this is indicative of subclinical LV dysfunction here's, here's an example here of a patient uh, this was from the, one of the guideline statements uh, patient with breast cancer who developed uh, you know, cardiac dysfunction after uh, doxorubicin and trastuzumab uh, therapy uh, so we have here kind of our three apical um, uh, the views here, and uh, you know, we get a we can plot these on a polar map, and we get a global longitudinal strain where it averages all these values. So you can see here, you know, certainly the negative 13, negative 17, negative 12. These are all slightly abnormal with some worse strain over here in this kind of basal anterolateral posterior segments. Another patient here. Um, so this is the same patient, but this is her pre uh, her pre-therapy echo at baseline, so global longitudinal strain it averages all these and they report negative 20.6%, so pretty normal. This is after therapy where they report a global longitudinal strain of, I believe it was like negative 14% um, here, and so her global longitudinal strain decreased from negative 20 to negative 14, so this is a 30% decrease in her strain, and this is considered significant as a, over 50% versus baseline. So again, uh, it is very easy to get kind of uh, confused Yeah, increase in the uh, absolute you know, number from negative 20 to negative 14, but a, a decrease in the strain. So yeah, it is, you know, uh, semantics uh, can make it somewhat confusing. Um, this is a patient with uh, breast cancer uh, using speckled tract of strain prior to uh, therapy. So here, you know, you can use global longitudinal strain. You can also measure radial strain and circumferential strain. And this is highlights for longitudinal strain and circumferential strain, we have negative values. But for radial, radial strain during systole, the wall thickens and we get positive numbers here. But typically, there's more data, uh, and certainly what we use now is kind of global longitudinal strain, uh, less kind of data for you know how to use the radial and circumferential strain values. So a few clinical cases just here from the clinic. Uh, this is a 55-year-old male uh, being evaluated for hypertension. Here is his live uh, 3D images. So we have apical 4, 2, and apical long axis. Um, just visually, you know, and by quantitative measures, his LV systolic function looks pretty normal with normal kind of regional uh, wall motion. Uh, we do strain, and we get pretty normal strain pattern. Um, you know, these are all, uh, you know, certainly negative 20, maybe a little bit reduced there, but, you know, overall his global strain is uh, relatively okay, negative 17, uh, maybe slightly abnormal with his hypertension. Um, one of the other things I didn't mention is for cardiac resynchronization, you know, these all line up uh, together. Uh, you can also look at uh, kind of uh, dyskinetic segments with a strain pattern that may peak earlier or later, indicative of dyssynchrony of the uh, myocardial tissue itself. So again, his same values uh, put on the polar map um, uh, with pretty normal strain. Another patient, similar uh, middle-aged male with hypertension. Again, his uh, 2D Echo images, certainly we appreciate significant uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, both on the apical uh, peristernal uh, long axis and short axis views here with normal LV systolic function. And again, his 4D images, so, you know, very quick to do. Uh, using the 4D probe, we get all images at the same time. And we measure strain, and compared to the last patient, we see marked uh, reduction in strain, uh, so less negative numbers uh, throughout, you know, maybe just uh, preserved kind of a couple apical segments, but overall, uh, a marked redu reduction in his global uh, strain. Again, same thing here on this plot, just a different way to look at it. Usually goes from the basal 
segments, the apex to the other uh, basal segment here. And we should see kind of this band of red um, showing normal strain, but instead we get these blue patterns. And again, with the curves here, certainly re uh, reduced strain, even some positive strain numbers at the basal segments. Another case, uh, a 90-year-old female, known history of coronary disease, prior intervention. Uh, clinically, she'd had CHF with ischemic cardiomyopathy with ventricular arrhythmias, and she has a dual-chamber ICD pacemaker um, with a, a demand pacing. So again, her images here, we certainly appreciate, uh, you know, basal segments are contracting, but, you know, uh, kind of a chronically uh, akinetic apical segments, maybe some dyskinesis at the apex here as well uh, with reduction in her EF. So if we look at strain here, and this kind of correlates well with her um, 2D images where we have marked reduction and even positive, in the, you know, indicative of kind of disconnected motion of the apical segments here with overall re reduction in strain. So even the basal segments were contracting, but, you know, they're, you know certainly they have uh, significant uh, systolic dysfunction, even though they appear to be thickening. And again, just another view, we have, you know, again, looking at the curves, this green and purple area, uh, lines are the apical segments here with positive numbers and then overall reduction in strain and just laid out here in this kind of flat model. This was a 60-year-old male with known uh, LED uh, stenosis. This was his coronary CT angio uh, where you know, laid out we kind of uh, certainly in the, kind of the mid uh, just beyond the diag of the LED we have some calcified segments in the area of severe uh, plaque and severe stenosis uh, right here. This is the CT myocardial perfusion Dr. Harrison was uh, mentioning earlier, where this looks at kind of um, uptaking the myocardial tissue itself. Um, you know, some of this may be uh, artifact, but here in the ap anterior apical segment, we see reduced uh, kind of uptake of the myocardial tissue indicative of reduced perfusion. Here's his 2D echo images. Um, so, you know, just visually looking at this, all the segment, we don't see kind of a gross regional wall motion abnormality. Areas seem to be thickening with overall, you know, fairly well-preserved uh, EF. We look at strain images here. Uh, again, we can see apical segments, pretty normal strain, um, kind of the inferior posterior segments. But this anterior, anterior uh, septal segments, uh, we see reduction in strain uh, or uh, less negative numbers. And if we kind of line these up uh, with the CT perfusion, you know, we can kind of, uh, we can see there's some correlation with this anterior uh, uh, segment uh, here uh, correlating with some reduced strain on his echo. Next is a 67 male with a LED disease and a known chronically occluded distal circumflex. So again, his 2D images, you know, we'd call this normal LV systolic function, at least in this view. Um, his images are somewhat more difficult to get 40 images, so we did uh, just 2D images, separate uh, uh, apical images for his strain. And we'll look at uh, this kind of basal uh, segment here uh, anterior basal and this uh, basal inferior lateral posterior segment here have marked uh, reduction of strain even, you know, with his other 2D images showing overall normal wall motion. And again, we kind of look at his CT perfusion, we see reduced uptake in this anterior segment as well as this kind of inferior lateral segment here, uh, likely correlating to his known or chronic uh, occluded circumflex artery. This is a 67-year-old female, history of chemotherapy, uh, treated with doxorubicin, uh, getting a follow-up echo. Again, uh, uh, 40 images, her ejection fraction overall pretty well preserved uh, with unchanged from prior echoes. Um, this is her strain pattern, so as, you know, similar to the other uh, examples we saw here, reduction in her global longitudinal strain of uh, negative 12%. Um, I think her prior baseline was around negative 17%. So we went from negative 17 to negative 12. She had a decrease of 28% uh, of strain. Uh, number went less negative. Um, theoretically, by some you know kind of recommendations, this would be considered a significant drop in her uh, you know example of cardiac dysfunction, even with a normal ejection fraction. So a few cases to go through. Um, you know, any questions or uh, uh, other things people like to add? Yeah, great discussion. Yeah, I think you know our biggest our biggest struggle is always to try to minimize the variation in the in the measurement just from the technique, and so that's very dependent on the different machines and different vendor and all that. That's our biggest issue. 
So basically what we've done here is it's been a long struggle uh, just with one tech and one echo machine and me. And the struggle has been to define what's real in terms of strain and what's artifact and how to get a good strain. And we took Dr. Marwick's uh, little course. He has a little course online where you exclude the papillary muscles and you do some stuff and you try to standardize it. And uh, of course the wall drops out and you can't use that. And so you learn some of the pitfalls. And so we did that like four years ago in anticipation of being in part of the Sakar study. And so uh, it's taken us really four years with one tech and a GE machine top of the line to develop what we figure is really some excellent strain images and that we believe what we see. And so it's one machine, one tech, and uh, we've learned to use 3D all the time uh, when we get good images. We learned how to define it with uh, the machine actually defining the strain automatically. Then we learned how to go over it and do it manually and make corrections. And uh, so we, but we've had some reality check and our reality check has been to do, you know, as you know, we're very committed to cardiac CT and with cardiac CT, we've been doing uh, myocardial perfusion imaging of the iodine and looking at how much the iodine is distributed in the myocardium. And so we've been using that polar map and comparing that polar map with the polar map of strain. And those two coming together have defined reality for us. And so then we've learned, you know, that we're really doing a good job and this is extremely useful. Uh, and only then did we really learn that and did it really click in. So it's taken four years for this to click in to be something useful for me clinically. And as you can see, I've held everything standard. I've got standard the tech, we've got the machine right here, and uh, we've got standard machine, no upgrades, no changes. And uh, we've got a tech that's been well-schooled. And then we do strain on every patient so that we have that kind of experience of having 15 cases a day and doing strain on everybody. And so then we read strain on everybody and then you really get good at it. And then the correlation with the CT MPI has been invaluable to me. Any uh, questions or comments about that? No, I mean, I think, I think it's great. I think it's, you know, a, a commitment to the technology and I think that's, that's great. Yeah, I think Just, Ron, hi, Daniel, how are you? Hello, who's this? Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. He's Rafael from Mexico. How are you? Oh, very good. good. How are you? How are you? Yeah, very good. I'm. I'm hearing. Hearing. Uh, let me uh, say thanks to the doctor who made the presentation. It was uh, very, uh, very understandable. The thing that I want to say is that uh, there's some point that we need to say. We need. When we, when we try to land this, all these uh, concepts of strain in clinical use, the first is that the, 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 the most popular clinical point in strain is global longitudinal or longitudinal strain in 2D right now. This is the most study. But the thing that we need to know is that some people believe that the longitudinal strain, uh, it drops before the left ventricle ejection fraction, which is not really the point. I mean, the point is that the, 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 the tools that we have for uh, measure uh, left ventricle ejection fraction have uh, more variability than the tools that we have to measure global longitudinal strain. So are more sensitive, global, longitud global longitudinal strain are more sense, have more sensitivity and specificity but are not so earlier the changes. I don't know if I explained me well, but the thing that we have with strain is that we have a better tool to see the inter-observer and intra-observer variability than, than a left ventricle ejection fraction. So that, uh, that's why it's very useful for uh, detecting a very uh, early change patterns in the, in the left ventricle function. Not, not that uh, change earlier, I mean, it drops earlier that led ventricle ejection fraction. And another thing that at other points on the strain than the circumferential strain and radial strain, 
I believe that 2D technologies are not uh, so proper to measure because, you know, when you see the, 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 the circumferential motion and radial motion in the left ventricle, you need a more uh, voxel uh, follow. I mean, are not only in two dimension. Maybe longitudinal, which is up and down uh, speckles that you follow, when you can do it better. But uh, when you saw the, 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 the torsion movement and the circumferential movement and the radial uh, enlargement at the heart, 2D technologies, I believe, they are not doing so good because the speckle it goes out of the image and you, you see another speckle. I don't know if I explain it well. You know that my English are not very good. But uh, I believe that we need to take care on these points. And we need to understand that global longitudinal strain are a very good tool. We need to see the intervendor changes that, that you see. And we need to think and we need to uh, put on mind that uh, are, are not earlier the changes. The tool that we use to measure global longitudinal strain are better than the tools that we use to left ventricle ejection fraction, which is the thing that why global longitudinal strain when when you, you when we use uh, this global longitudinal strain good very well thinking, and uh, we maybe can uh, have a clinical land on the every uh, thesis. I hope I hope I explain me well. Yeah, you did a good job explaining that. I understand what you're saying, uh, Rafael. And so uh, we're using, to, to define uh, strain, we're using like calipers, and to find uh, ejection fraction, we got a yardstick. And so that makes a lot of difference. And so I understand that well. And uh, most of the stuff that we do with ejection fraction is kind of an eyeball test, and uh, y your eyeballs are not so good. And so the strain, it's all finally mechanized with the computer doing everything and there's nothing to eye and so the information comes back and you say ah oh, hmm that's interesting and you look at the uh, sort of polar map appearance and uh, you can see exactly where that is and then you can try to correlate it with something and what we're correlating it with is myocardial perfusion imaging with uh, CT with iodine distribution and so at least we've got something to challenge it and to correlate it with, which has been help, very helpful for me, because before it was existing in a vacuum, and I, I had nothing to say, oh, okay, that's right, or, or that's not right. And so now I've got something that I can say, hmm, it, that seems to fit. And it's making sense because there's a diagonal vessel, and the diagonal vessel has less iodine uh, going down to uh, the anterior lateral wall. And look, oh, look, the strain on uh, the speckle tracking echo 3D imaging is showing less anterior lateral wall, uh, well, not less, it'd be greater strain, which would go minus 20 to minus 14. So there you go. So uh, this is Barry Trachtberg from, from Houston Methodist. A great talk. I really enjoyed it. Just a, a couple of questions to, to those of you that are the physicians that are using this and have implemented it into their practice. What are you doing as the cardiologist when you're reading these and, and kind of quality control and some of the caveats of, of, you know, are you looking at blood pressure when you're looking at the strain to make sure that's okay? And what other things that after it's already been processed are, are you looking at to, to make sure that, that it looks like an accurate evaluation of strain? Hi, Dr. Harrison. Hello. Hi, hello, it's Veronica from Brazil. How are you? Oh, good. It's so nice to hear from you today. Yes, unfortunately, I can see the images again. I just listened, and I would like to uh, to give my congratulations for the nice uh, speech. I have a, a, a brief question, if possible. Uh, how could we explain the usual finding that the lower values in the basal segments in the, because sometimes the patient is no, the, the the patient is normal. They in fact he doesn't has any uh, strain global longitudinal strain alteration. But the lower lower values in the basal segments are usually found. How could we explain that? 
So uh, why is it that the basilar norm is the basal the basal segments usually had uh, presents with lower uh, strain values even in normal subjects? I would like just to have an explanation for this. Okay, I think Dr. Bonchi's did a, a, a good job of that when he actually showed some great images of the effects of torsion and the fact that the base was going uh, one direction and the apex was going the other direction and uh, those were having uh, an effect. And so he was able to show that unfor unfortunately we don't see the myocardium as it really is and we don't see it one as a, that the muscle, the myo myofibrils are syncytial muscles and so they're all connected in a very weird way. And so we don't see an, the myocardium as a syncytium, which it really is. And so all, all muscles are related. And then we don't see uh, these different motions occurring simultaneously uh, in, this, in a different plane. And so one, we've got torsion in one plane. And then we've got uh, contraction in another plane. And then we've got thickening in the other plane. But life doesn't exist in three different planes. It exists in, in a 3D image. And so all of those are interrelating. And so I think it's the difference in the interrelationship, especially that one area is going clockwise in one plane and counterclockwise in, in, the, in, the, in another area in, in, the, in the same plane. And so I think that's if you've got a towel and you're twisting one way on one end of the towel and the other end on the other end of the towel, you're measuring the ends, it's clearly uh, different. And you measure the middle and it's somewhat conflictual. And then as you move from the middle towards the right hand, which is twisting clockwise, and then from the middle to the left hand, which is twisting counterclockwise, you're certainly getting uh, uh, a confounding information. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, it, 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 it does. But my, my question uh, still remains in why and how can we differentiate this? strain values, these lower strain values uh, from an abnormal situation in a normal situation. How can we believe? Or oh, we only can consider it the global longitudinal average of the strain and don't consider the regional strain in each segment. Yeah, I think you probably, you know, I, I'm not as sophisticated on as all the other people who have been speaking today about the the strain issues, but that's probably what I would say on that, is that if you really look at just a particular segment, Looks good. Then, then you have a number of issues yeah. where you, you may have local ischemia or you may have some uh, bundle branch block and lead to some change in the uh, normal deformation, so you'd have to include all of those as possibilities of why you would have differences in a in a small region. So probably the global longitudinal strain is a is a better general measurement. But that's just my opinion. Yeah, I think uh, that's a good rule of thumb. But I think that the errors can come on the regional differences when you introduce an error that then becomes systemic when it adds to the global longitudinal strain. And so I really want to know you know, what's going on in these regions? And so I'm very interested in that because I'm interested in coronary artery disease. I'm interested in what's, what's, if it's an error from a technical point, from the technician, that that piece of the myocardium isn't clearly seen and we're trying to define strain on it and that's why the error was introduced. Or if it's a diagonal lesion and that's the anterior lateral wall or the apex. And so I, re I really want, I, I want to look at those specific areas of strain. But of course I've got, great quality control because we've got the tech here, we've got the machine here, it's all the same, and I'm drifting in and out of the echo room as patients come in to see what's going on with them. And so, but um, Nick here has posted this slide to show you uh, the difference in systolic strain, and we got the apex, which is a hugely difference of minus 13, and we've got uh, the base that's minus 22, and so but this is calibrated on the global map as normal, 
for the base and normal uh, for the apex. And so then if there's a color-coded change and it changes to blue, it's drastically abnormal. And if it gets light pink, then it's... And so those, those are things that first I want to exclude them as being any kind of technical error. And then the second, you know, is there something wrong with the heart? And of course, it's going to be totally different left bundle branch block, and you got to compare that with all patients with left bundle branch block and what's normal for left bundle branch block. And of course, it's been totally different for pacer, and you've got to compare that with all patients with that kind of pacer, with the IV pacer or whatever it is. And so that that's going to introduce uh, some differences, uh, and uh, you have to understand that and compare it to the people that have the same pathology. So, um, so this just shows that, and so it's, it's different. I mean, we're talking about the torsion uh, component that's being added to uh, the strain that can't be excluded. It can't be excluded. Yeah, I'll make a quick comment. I mean, all very good points where you know, typically we're looking at global longitudinal strains, certainly probably the most studied from, you know, what I've seen so far. It certainly it depends probably on the disease state. So if we're looking at more of a systemic disease that's going to affect the heart globally, you know, certainly our, you know, probably biggest concern or, you know, we're focusing more on the global longitudinal strain or global strain as opposed to individual wall segments as opposed to certain pathologies where we may be looking at regional variations such as coronary disease. My question, and I don't know this, maybe someone else out there does, you know, just looking at this kind of a distribution of normal uh, kind of strain, you know, we see a difference in kind of maybe the septum, basal, the apical segments, a different distribution of, you know, the, the ratio of these versus the anterior wall where maybe there's more contribution from uh, strain from the basal segments versus the anterior segments, and, and you know, these change depending on which wall, you know, certainly the LV is connected to the RV and they interact together, so just looking at one value doesn't tell the whole picture, looking at 3D structure, you know, my, just bringing up a question from looking at this is, with global longitudinal strain, should each segment be weighted, you know, differently, you know, right now we're just taking all these longitudinal values, averaging them together, should, you know, longitudinal strain on one particular wall segment that contributes more, should that be weighted differently from one segment where it's less important? Is that a better estimate of global longitudinal strain as opposed to weighting them all equally? Um, I don't know if that's been looked at or considered or not. Yeah, maybe a good clue should be the comparison between the patient with himself at the baseline test before the chemotherapy, for example, and then uh, realize if it's really uh, normal or abnormal. What do you think about it? That's a very good point. You've got to have each individual patient's fingerprint. And so that's a very good point. Uh, Rafael is having a meeting in Mexico soon. Is that correct, Rafael? Is Rafael still on? I guess he's not still on. There's a meeting in Mexico that he wants us to tell, tell everybody about. And so let me see. I think I have a slide on it. So uh, see what I can do to show you. Uh, here we go. Let me get this up. And there's a meeting in Mexico coming up that Rafael wants to know about. That is a summit on cardio-oncology. And it looks like it's not Cinco de Mayo, but it's uh, 20, 25 de Mayo, whatever that is. I wish I knew better Spanish. So it's 25 de Mayo. It's actually the 24th, 25th, 26th, and 27th of a summit that uh, he is having that should be uh, a lot of fun. And uh, I suppose that he's having that. It doesn't say where it is, but uh, he's in Veracruz. I think, it's, uh, I think it's in Mexico City. Oh, Mexico City. Okay, great. So uh, I see... Lots of pictures of strain, so I suppose there's going to be a lot of strain on the poster. I see a lot of strain, and then I see uh, a picture of Anna Barak, and I see uh, Dan Linehan, and uh, someone else. And, Juan Carlos. Uh, Juan Carlos, there we go. So it looks like it's going to be a great time there, especially I see a lot of cardiac imaging, which I should go to that. So there we go. Perfect. Well, and then the the other thing is is I probably should have a slide up on the website, but just for those who are on the call, the the Global Cardio Oncology Summit is going to be September 20 and 21st in London, 
and it will be at the Royal College of Physicians. So mark those dates. Well, that sounds jolly good. So I certainly want to go to that. And we'll see Alex Lyon there, our good friend. And uh, also we'll see a gentleman from... We better. We better see him there. Gentleman from the Brompton, uh, who I met uh, at uh, Global, who's a MRI uh, person. And so we should have a lot of fun there. That should be... And then the following year, it's going to be in a wonderful place called Tampa, Florida. So we want to make sure people get that on their calendar, too, the following Absolutely. year. Absolutely. To come to Tampa. Okay. So happy to do it. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, thank you guys. That was really fantastic. I actually learned a lot about strain today. So. Yeah, we have Andreas on too. Andreas from Argentina. Hello, Andreas. Uh, it looks like you're self-muted, but you can say hello if you'd like to. If you're, if you're. Uh... All right. We had. I better. We had great attendance today. Marcelo uh, is here. Hello, Marcelo. Marcelo is here from uh, Brazil, and so we have great, great attendance today, and so thank you so much for attending, and uh, Dan, thanks for your comments. Uh, oh, and, thanks a lot, uh, Eric. That was Marika, great. Thank, thank you for your comments, and we're, we're trying to define reality in 3D images and how we see it, and I think the only solution is to have your own machine wheeled in the clinic each time, and it's your, actually it's the same one each time and the same tech each time is the only solution to be able to do this. It can't be like a, a factory. It has to be very, very patient, precise, and specific is my point. Okay? Perfect. All right. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, Eric. Everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye, Janine. Bye, Arjun. Bye, come through me.